the message that I prepared today uh, is uh, what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you, right? Uh, I know uh, constantly we hear things of, you know, what does God require me? You know, we always tend to think, uh, which are true, you know, I'm going to pray, I'm going to read the, my Bible, you know, testimony and all these. And of course, all those things are true. We've gone over these things uh, many, many times before. But I was, uh, when I was uh, going over this message, it was, um, it was kind of uh, mirroring, like mirroring the, uh, am I saying that right? Mirroring, similar, similar to the people of Israel, the Old Testament, and to what the church is today. And uh, today in Micah, the prophet Micah in the book of Micah 6, chapter uh, 6 through 8, it says, <clears throat> With what shall I come before the Lord to honor him? And bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Will the Lord be delighted with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my acts of rebellion, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you except to be just, hear this, to be just, to love and practice kindness and compassion, and to walk humbly with your God, setting aside overblown, uh, over, any overblown sense of importance and self-righteousness. So this passage is uh, one that I, can, I consider to be a very comprehensive statement of the, in the Old Testament, um, in which the question is, set up by the prophet Micah, what does the Lord require of you? And, um, and he makes, makes these points here to live justly, to be just, you know, to, uh, to love and show mercy and to walk humbly with our God, not only for the sake of this time during the old Testament, when he was talking to the people of Israel, but today, in today's church, you know, nothing has changed. We serve the same God uh, before, you know, now and forever. He doesn't change, right? We all know that. God is the same God. Uh, and a lot of times uh, I hear uh, a lot of preachers and you, you know, you know, like seminars and stuff like that. And a lot of uh, new doctrine today kind of pushes aside the Old Testament. You know, basically they think my Bible starts in Matthew and that's it. You know, it starts from there. And, and no, it's not. It, it starts from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is just as important as the New Testament. It's all together. In fact, a lot of times in order to understand a lot of the Gospels and uh, in the New Testament, you have to know the Old Testament because obviously the, the apostles and, and were, were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They wrote the Bible. But a, a lot of it, what they were writing, was everything that they had learned from, you know, the, the Torah and the, the, the uh, prophets and the Proverbs and the Psalms. All those things were everything that they had learned from. So a lot of times when we just strictly uh, point our, uh, put our point of view of just the New Testament, we miss a lot of context of what the, uh, the apostles are writing in the New Testament. So keep in mind that. In fact, in Romans 15:4 it says, "For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instructions, our instructions today, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope and overflow with confidence in its promise." Let us pray. Dear Father, creator of all things, we we thank you, Father, and we give you praise for this wonderful opportunity to be in your presence one more time. We ask, Father God, that your Holy Spirit give us insight into your word, into your message and revelation, Father God, that we may be able to, to, to be better and to grow better, Father, as Christians, that we can be just, Father, that we can show mercy and that we can always be humble in your sight. We ask, Father God, to, to let us, Father, strive each day and let us shine, Father God, the light that you have put in us, that we may be that example, a good testimony to the world, and that people may see us. And through that, we may be able to encourage and evangelize, Father God, your word. We ask, Father God, for your, for your spirit and for your goodness to fall upon this church. 
amongst brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, we love you, and we worship you, and we give you praise. And in Jesus' name, we say, amen. All right. I feel like the, the sun came out right when that happened. All right. That's a good thing. So the Old Testament is just as important as the New Testament, okay? So what does the Lord require of you? Let's see. What did the Lord require of Israel? Um, some of the possibilities. So uh, the verse that I read at the, the very beginning, talking about uh, year-old calves, burnt offerings, thousands of rams, uh, 10,000 rivers of oil, offering your firstborn child, uh, all these things were the prophet was trying to like kind of express and he was kind of just telling himself uh, obviously exaggerating obviously he's not going to give thousands of rivers of oil because obviously in the old in the old testament uh before of course christ was the ultimate sacrifice people did have to do these things they, they gave sacrifices uh for their sins for their rebellion and it was more of a way of covering their sins because obviously it wasn't until Jesus' ultimate sacrifice where he shed his blood on the cross where the sins were now washed away. But in the Old Testament, it was pretty much just covering, waiting for the Messiah, waiting for Christ to eventually uh, wipe it out. So he, he's kind of just, kind of just, Lord, what do you ask of us? You know, we're, he's kind of exaggerating. Do you want all, you know, what can I do to please you to, to live a, a righteous life? And uh, obviously today sometimes we kind of go the same route just as the people of israel you know uh, a lot of times uh it happens when it can happen actually when we first even accept the lord as, as our savior or we can uh maybe have a an encounter with the lord uh maybe we we went to a service that was just really re you're just really feeling it you know and you're on fire for the lord or some kind of christian concert or something like that which uh or uh, sometimes it can be when you're in need maybe you're sick maybe someone else is in need you know and what we do is we tend to to promise god a lot of things with our words and with our works we're like lord uh, you know i promise if if you know if you if you help me in this or or maybe you don't you know if you don't even need help maybe like i said maybe you're just inspired by a, a super awesome preaching or worship service and you start saying lord i'm i'm going to you know what i'm changing my life i'm 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 going to uh start praying every day and i'm gonna start evangelizing i'm gonna go to all the cell groups and i'm gonna get into ministry and i'm gonna do all these things and we start kind of overextending we kind of over exaggerate just kind of like like the prophet saying lord i'm i'm gonna we're, we'll, we'll offer thousands of calves we'll we'll give you rivers of wool we'll do all these things and the lord is trying to kind of say look don't don't try it. You cannot impress me with your offerings. You can't. Uh, you know. You can offer me all the, the the cattle and and everything you want. That's not what pleases me. What pleases me is you following my commandments. Uh, what pleases me is is you being just and living a just life away from sin, from loving uh, mercy and, and having compassion on your fellow man and brothers and sisters and even our enemies and for also for walking humbly in the Lord. So kind of the same situation, the church today, we kind of have the same situation as the people of Israel. So uh, from that context, it might appear as ritualistic, you know, sacrifices alone do not please God. Amen. One could uh, not please God simply by these innumerable sacrifices just as today we can say all the things with our words we can impress you know uh try to to say and, and not that it's not a good thing i i encourage you to to make these packs and to make you know lord i'm gonna try my best but always remember that before we do this and before we get kind of wrapped up with emotionalism emotion we have to first remember what put us in that situation a lot of times we might feel like hey i need to get closer to god i need to do these i'm going to do all this thing why are you in that position why are the people of israel in this point and i and we'll kind of go in we won't go really deep because there's a lot of parts in 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 the old testament where the people of israel were god's people right uh but they made a lot of mistakes they did a lot of things wrong and a lot of times consequences fell on the people of israel 
which led them into captivity, losing wars, uh, uh, being enslaved. And this not just happened once. It's happened constantly with the people of Israel. And today, I believe it's the same thing that happens to the church today. We tend to overreact and try to do things with our works. And what do I mean by works? By by getting into ministry or trying to do things where people can see, say, look, you know, that person is serving God. Look, they're preaching or they're evangelizing or they're they're doing this Christian podcast or something like that. Or, you know, they're going to church every Sunday. But inside our, our, our you know, our heart, we're, we're far from the Lord or we're, we're doing things that we know that we shouldn't be doing. And those are the things that are really keeping us from achieving the, the, the right walk with God, okay? Amen. So we know that doing things by our works is not what God wants. What does God require of Israel? What does God require of the church today? Well, the prophet answered his own question in saying, to do justly. We have to live a just life. He's telling Israel at the same time, we have to to be just. This means to act toward God and man according to the divine standard of righteousness revealed in his law. Follow the law. Follow the commandments. Uh, now today, like I said before, we don't have to sacrifice animals. We don't have to, please don't be sacrificing animals and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but today, because we know that God is the ultimate sacrifice, he did that for us. He paid the price. We no longer have to worry about that. Uh, but this also involved treating their fellow man in the way that was fair and just. See, the people of Israel during this time, during the prophet's time, were not necessarily doing everything they were supposed to be doing. Uh, I'm going to read uh, this verse, and then we'll kind of go in depth. It's in Zechariah uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 8 through 14, and it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus, has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion to each other. And do not oppress the, or exploit the widow or the fatherless, the stranger or the poor. And do not devise or even imagine evil in your heart, in your hearts against one another. But they refused, this is the people of Israel saying, but they refused to listen and pay attention and turned to a stubborn shoulder stiffening themselves in resistance and stopped up their ears. Verse 12, they made their hearts hard like flint so that they could not hear the law and the words in which the Lord of hosts had sent by the Spirit through the former prophets. Uh, Therefore, great wrath came from the Lord of hosts, and just as he called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen, says the Lord God. But I scattered them with a wind and a storm uh, among all the nations whom uh, they had not known. So, because, because of how they were living, God pretty much let Israel be succumbed by their enemies. They become enslaved. They got conquered, you know? Uh, and a lot of times we uh, think that this is just happening to Israel. Um, like, for example, we see a lot of people that are, are are making mistakes or committing errors, or maybe we really don't. And there's a lot of people that we know in the church, sometimes they have ministries, they have, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, maybe pastors or preachers, and, and, and they're doing these things. And uh, or, or, or maybe they're not even that, but they're, you know, they're going to church. And you know, you know for a fact, there's like, hey, I know that th- that person's doing this, or maybe they're being hypocritical, or maybe they're, you know, lying, or maybe they're cheating, or they're, uh, uh, you know, doing unmorally, right? And sometimes you feel like, man, but they, it seems like they get away with it. They're still on the ministry, or they're still doing well at their job, and, and they're still buying new cars, and it looks like they're being blessed, You know, a lot of times we see that, but just remember, this doesn't happen for long. Eventually things catch up. Eventually things catch up. Just as the people of Israel, they were a blessed, blessed country. They were God's people. They had so much wealth and they were conquering nations over and over. 
But eventually, what happened is that they, their hearts, they weren't being just. They weren't having a just life. They weren't walking humbly upon the Lord, and they're, they're, they weren't showing love and mercy. And a lot of times, um, this happens today in the church. See, one of the things that I kind of grabbed from this uh, message is that the people of Israel, when they were succumbed by their enemies and they weren't doing well, and you know God let them be conquered, they were still doing everything that they were supposed to be doing in a way. They were still going to the temple all the time. They were still reading the law. They were still giving sacrifices. They were still doing all the things that they were supposed to be doing. Just as today, we're still going to church. We're still giving our tithes. We're still coming and, 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 and being involved in ministry. You know, we're still doing all the things, if you want to say, right on paper. But what happened to Israel? They got conquered because they, in their hearts, were not living right. And that is what happens today in the church. We can be doing, we could be giving the sacrifices like they were. We can be listening to the law and going into the temple and doing everything they were supposed to be doing. And they thought that they were right. They thought that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. But the prophet would come and tell them, hey, you know, you have to stop doing this. You have to stop doing these. They were over here practicing things over here behind closed doors. And then little by little, it was starting to come out, practicing pagan rituals and doing all this, being unjust to their fellow uh, brothers and sisters. And what happened? God pretty much said, I'm not going to hear you anymore. And then when they needed God, when their enemies came, God said, you're on your own. You know? And what happened? They fell. It's the same exact thing that's today. Remember, we were how we said before, there God is not different then than he is today, right? We serve the same God yesterday, today, and always. He doesn't change. It, does, it doesn't make the difference that this was in the Old Testament and this is the New Testament. We have to strive to always live a just life, to always always watch what we're doing, to to love and have mercy and compassion upon our brothers and sisters and to be humble. Amen. So we understand that a lot of times these things do come and affect us, you know, and, and, and sometimes um, a lot of times I'll hear people saying, well, you know, I know this person was like cheating on his wife or something like that. And they just kind of get away with it years ago and go, and, and, and then I've heard people say, well, like, but, but I mean, they're still doing good. You know, they're still living a good life, you know, and they're still in ministry and they still uh, preach or do these things. A lot of times what I've seen from my experience and from what I've seen is that sin doesn't always necessarily uh, have the same consequence that we think. For example, if you are in, you know, living an adulterous life or, or maybe you're cheating, you know, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, financially or doing so, that doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen. Like you might get caught or eventually things come out. You know, we know that all sin eventually comes out. But a lot of times what I've seen is that it can affect us physically. Sometimes you want, it's like, whoa, you know, all of a sudden this person is doing this and then they get sick. Or maybe it affects their finances. You know, all of a sudden they were living on top of the world. Uh, they were, uh, you know, doing well, but then all of a sudden they lose their job, you know, all of a sudden, you know, maybe they, they lose their house or, or maybe they, they, it could be their family. Sometimes it could be their kids. I've seen this so many times where the, you know, it doesn't even affect the couple itself, you know, the marriage, but it affects their, their kids, you know, their kids stop going to church or maybe they get involved with the wrong crowd. And then all of a sudden, it's because everything has a consequence. All everything that we do, sin-wise, has a consequence, and it and, and you just don't know how it's going to affect your life. That's why I, I encourage you to always strive to live, you know, properly to, to live just. Always, always, I, I reiterate, uh, picking up and carrying your cross each day, not just one time. Not just on Sundays, but every day. You pick up your cross, carry it every day. Because every day 
we have to strive. Every day we have to work uh, uh, in, in our life as Christians. I always heard it is not a race, but it's more of a marathon, right? It's not who, who finishes first, but as long as we make it to the finish line. Amen. Okay, so God wants us to be just and live a just life, just like he was telling the people of Israel. He also said to love mercy. <clears throat> Now, this means to show compassion toward man, not only to treat uh, others fairly, but to show mercy when mistreated. Uh, One reason they were to love mercy was because God himself, obviously, you know, uh, delights in mercy. (laughs) Sometimes I feel like, thank goodness God is who he is and he's not like us. Uh, In in Micah also, it says in chapter seven, it says, "Who who is a God like you? who forgives wickedness and passes over rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession. He does not restrain his anger forever because he constantly delights in mercy and loving kindness. So thank God, right? Thank goodness that we serve a merciful God, a loving God, because if he's like us, even though sometimes we'll get angry and, you know, we, Uh, have things toward people and we're like okay you know we you know i forgive them and stuff but you never totally forget right you always have that little uh, chip on your shoulder you know and stuff like that but god is not like that god is a merciful god okay so as tough as it might seem sometimes we always have to strive mercy and uh to those who are constantly making uh mistakes or even attacking us and persecuting us um uh i remember uh this one story of this is a while back um and there was this one uh person that was in my life for for a certain time and uh i remember uh, constantly I, I was here working at the church i was when i first started and uh or a little after and i remember he would constantly he would come every once in a while it was a i guess a friend of mine and uh but he would constantly argue with me and constantly talk about how what I believed was false and, you know, and, you know, that a lot of the things that we did was hypocritical and this and that. And I remember he was smart and he didn't make a lot of good points. And sometimes he even kind of stumped me in some things, you know, and uh, and he was, you know, very kind of arrogant and he would ridicule me and stuff like that. But I don't I for some reason during that time in my life, God just gave me without me even knowing uh uh, compassion. Like, I never really went strong on him. I told him, no, you know, this is how it is, and this is what we believe. And I was usually really nice with him. In fact, I would even take him to eat sometimes, and we would argue there too. Or he would argue with me, and I would just, you know, kind of take it. And he would, you know, say things about me, or say things about the family, or this and that. And, you know, kind of sometimes playing around, but, you know, kind of that, you know, nudge, you know, where I knew that uh, he, he's serious about this. And, uh, but I remember, uh, occasion, you know, I would even occasionally pray for him. Not only would I take him to eat, I would actually even pray for him sometimes and say, you know, Lord, you know, I asked for this person to, to see what, what, what's true. Uh, you know, what, what I believe uh, to, to see you for what you are, that you are loving God. And, uh, now I know that you probably have, I don't know if anyone has experienced this in your life. Like there's been people that that tell you what you believe is wrong or why do you keep going to church or why do y'all do that or and and sometimes it might make you feel bad and you kind of want to just like retaliate against them and what i encourage you to do is is not necessarily go strong and try to go at them and you know uh super aggressive but you know take compassion have mercy on them because they are lost you know and just as god just as we were lost You know, God have compassion and mercy on us and gave us that opportunity to find him. So I do think that the right approach is, you know, listen to them, pray for them, talk to them. And uh, one of the things uh, that I saw was eventually, yes, it does come a point where I remember in my life with this person, I had to eventually kind of just start separating myself from them because <clears throat> there comes a point where if you hang around with them too much, they eventually are going to have an effect on you, right? And uh, that's not good either. 
So eventually, you know, I had to like, you know, kind of push him away. I, I still prayed for him every once in a while. And, and, but you know, you obviously, there has to become a point too where you say, okay, enough is enough. You know, <clears throat> I pray for you. God bless you, you know. And, uh, but you know, this is what I, this is the truth. This is what I believe. And I'm, nothing's going to change from that. And I'm not going to be affected by the uh, environment or the toxic, uh, you know, atmosphere that you're presenting to me. Well, anyways, uh, now today, uh, this person is actually Christian, you know, eventually it came to the point where he did uh, accept the Lord. So maybe all those times that we were arguing, the seed that I was presenting did have an effect. It just took a while. It took years. You know, and eventually he did come around. He did accept Christ. And he even came to the church for a while. And uh, now I think he's, uh, he's he's still a Christian now. He has a family and uh, he goes to his brother's church. His brother became a pastor. And and uh, so, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it's funny. Uh, he's still as arrogant as ever. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but the thing is that he did come around. And a lot of times this happens. So we have to just pray try to engage the situation smart ask god for wisdom separate yourself obviously if it is affecting you but always know that let god deal with those people i always said let god fight your battles you know a lot of times uh i don't know how many people have been here and said man this person i wish i wish that something almost bad would happen to them you know has anyone ever felt like that i know you have you know like you know or why do they keep getting this you know why do they keep getting you know they just got a new job or they got a brand new house and this and that and they're 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 so not living right you know and they do go to church but they're not living right so that makes it worse because they're christians and they're they're just being hypocritical you know and uh uh but what i've kind of learned and it's it's something that i you know i have to struggle even with today we have to like push ourselves put ourselves back and say you know what lord you are control, and you fight the battle. This is a, a, a fight with with you, Father, and that person, not with me. You know, I'm going to keep doing what you want me to do. I'm going to live my life right, and I'm going to take all that anger and all that, separate myself from those people, but have compassion and have love and wish the best for them. Maybe even pray for them, <laughs> you know, and then you'll never know. God God works in uh, miracle. God can work miracles sometimes, even when you think it's impossible. Amen. Everyone here? God bless you. All right. Okay, so God said to live just, to have a just life, uh, to love mercy and have compassion. He also said to walk humbly in God. Now, this is something, this involves living in humble and uh, submissive obedience to his desired will. It can only happen when we recognize the absolute holiness and righteousness of God. It is in his humble of heart and spirit that greatly pleases God. In Isaiah 66, 1 through 2, it says, This is what the Lord says, But to this one I will look graciously to him who is humble and remorseful in in spirit and and who revertly trembles at my word and honors my commands. So, one thing that I will always, always stress uh, is that we have to live a humble life. Uh, this happens, and I've, I've probably touched upon this before, this happens so much to us as Christians, especially the more that we've become involved in church the more that we probably get ministry maybe even a position like maybe all of a sudden you know you're in charge of this uh cell group or you're in charge of the the youth ministry or you're in charge of uh, this um you know the praise and worship team or you are in charge of the cameras or, or something you know god gives you a position maybe you're starting to preach maybe you're starting to evangelize maybe uh so many different things that happen always remember that it is so easy for us as humans to start thinking ourselves that it's our talents and it's our abilities that are putting us in that and no now i know that a lot of people are capable of doing these things 
You know, we see it in the world all the time that people are capable of doing a lot of things and achieving a lot of things and being awesome leaders and stuff like that. But that's not what God, that's not what pleases God. What pleases God is in your heart. You don't have to be the most awesomest singer to please God as long as you do that with your heart and you do worship. You don't have to be an awesome preacher and be preaching to tens of thousands of people as long as you do it with your heart. Because a lot of times, people get put in that situation and things kind of start falling apart in their life. You know, because it is a lot of, it is a lot of a, a, a position sometimes for we as humans to, to, to overtake. You know, because we have to always strive to be humble. God loves a humble heart. King David uh, king of, uh, of Israel, most powerful person at the time, was, was the personification sometimes of being humble. He was king, but yet he would fall on the floor and throw the dirt, uh, you know, right there where all the people could see, uh, pleading to God, asking for forgiveness, doing these things, not caring about what the people are going to say or say, what? What are you doing? You're, you're the king of Israel, you know? No. Because he had a humble heart. He was a, a man after God's own heart. And sometimes we tend to want to impress and, and try to show a different uh, life to the people that are looking at us. And, you know, then, but really, we have to worry about God who is looking at us. Amen. I know, like social media, a lot of times we see people have like the awesomest life, right? on social media and on the things like that. Man, they have such an uh, awesome life. But we know that sometimes this is not true. This is what they're showing people. But you can't trick God, you know? You can even trick your heart. A lot of times, you know, we can even trick ourselves to thinking I have an awesome life and I am doing right because I do go to church and I do have a ministry. And uh, yeah, you know what? I am, I know I'm, I, I'm probably doing some stuff over here, Shady, but you know what? I know I'm still doing good. You can even trick yourself. But remember, we cannot trick God. We cannot fool God, you know. And always try and strive to have a humble heart. Amen. So what does the Lord require of us? We might think sometimes it's um, just like the people of Israel, these ritualistic uh, sacrifices and going to the temple, which are were necessary, that is not what pleases God. Amen. So today, what does God require of you? Maybe attending church, maybe evangelizing or being in the worship t- team, giving your tithes. You know, all these things are awesome and, they, and, and they definitely are necessary. I, I believe that going to church is very necessary. It uh, helps us gather together in brothers and sisters and fellowship and together in the body of Christ. We grow spiritually. Um, uh, but that is not what determines what uh, uh, your heart is. That's not what determines where your heart is. Those works are not necessarily what determines where your heart is. You know, we have to do more than just our works and our words and just promising God thousands of rivers of oil. Or like, Lord, I'm going to read the whole Bible today. <laughs> you know, you know uh, we have to be realistic. But we also have to remember why a lot of times are you in that position? What put yourself in that position? How are you living your life? Inspect your life every day. So the Lord requires more than just attending church, being in ministry, um, uh, evangelizing and doing these things. He requires us to live a just life. Just as he was telling the people of Israel, live a just life, to love mercy, to show compassion toward man, even toward our enemies, to walk humbly with our God. The only way to enjoy his fellowship and continuous cleansing by the blood of Jesus Such close uh, communion and fellowship with God requires daily, we know, listening to the word, whether it's reading the word out loud or just reading the the word, listening to it, praying, talking with God, and always constantly examining our lives every day, every day, trying to keep ourselves from the situations that we know sometimes 
puts us in a predicament. Amen? I know nobody has that problem here. Everybody's doing good. Praise God. Okay, so in conclusion, even though, obviously, even though we live in a different kind of covenant today uh, than the people in the Old Testament, uh, we still live by the same basic principles. We must follow his commandments. We must be just. We must love mercy. We must show compassion. And we must be humble. You know, God, like I said before, now reiterate it always, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. And we cannot keep things. Uh, even if we think we can hide things for our fellow brothers and sisters, your husband, your wife, your uh, friend, we cannot hide these things from God. And eventually, sin will catch up. Will catch up. It could get, it could take years. It could take weeks. It could. I don't know. Everyone's different. Everyone is it has a different relationship. But eventually, all these things come to light. So we constantly have to pray. We constantly have to pick up our cross and carry it. So, are you doing what the Lord requires of you? Consider. Have you done justly by obeying the gospel of Christ? Do you love mercy? Are we being compassionate and loving toward people? You know, trying to not wish ill upon those people that were like, ah, they they deserve it. But no, we have to bring ourselves back and say, God, this is your battle. You deal with it. Are you walking humbly with God? Are you being arrogant? Are you like, oh, you know, I'm this and that. I, You know people that are like that, right? And a lot of times this doesn't last very long. And, uh, and if it does, eventually it will catch up because God wants a humble heart. So if you're not living, uh, you know, maybe you, you go to church and like I said before, you might be doing all these things. But always remember that God is, is the, the principal key that you got to carry your cross each day. May we all do what the Lord requires of us each day. Amen. Hallelujah. Why don't we get a hand clap? So in conclusion, the three principles that uh, the prophet Micah uh, was trying to say is to live a just life, number one, to love mercy and have compassion, number two, and to walk humbly in the Lord. If we can do these three principles, follow his commandments, we can have an awesome life and, and, and God will have so many blessings upon our lives. Amen. Let us stand. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, finish in prayer. Uh, let us bow our heads and let us pray to the Lord. Father God, creator of all the universe, we give you thanks and we give you praise for this wonderful day. We ask, Father God, for your covering for your enlightenment, Father God, for your Holy Spirit to, to give us wisdom that we may be able to make the right choices and take the right steps to be able to have a good Christian life and a good foundation amongst brothers and sisters. As you have revealed to us, Father, through your Holy Word, we ask, Father, to let us recognize, Father, if we are getting out of line so we could have a just life, we ask, Father God, to give us that compassion, that love for our brothers and sisters, and for, even for our enemies, that, that you deal, Father God, with them, but you give us that love and compassion. We ask, Father, that we always, always be set in point and to be humble. I always ask, Father God, that it is better for us to lose a ministry and, and lose your even the anointing than to be, to, to be taken off, Father God, from the altar then to not be humble and to not be in line with your word. Because most of all, the most important thing that we understand, Father, is to serve you and to walk with you and to one day live in your heavenly kingdom forever and ever. We ask, Father, for guidance, wisdom upon, upon everybody here today, brothers and sisters, that we may go out into the world and we can be that light and show good testimony that we are Christians and that we serve a mighty God. In Jesus' name, we love you, we worship you, and we give you all the praise. And in Jesus' name we say, amen. amen. Hallelujah. God bless y'all.